Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Well, hello and welcome to, or welcome back to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thanks for coming along on the journey of this show that is designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor of being the co-host for this show, along with Craig Brown, an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig, how are you today? I'm great, Tom. It's really fabulous being together for a change. This is one of the first shows that we've ever had the ability to do where we're all in the same room with the guests because we're here at ConX19 in San Diego. And uh, today we are with Martin Dallart, and he is the lead architect configuration management for ASML. And we're really pleased we get to sit here with him and talk to him. So Martin, welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm an architect, but I wasn't an architect always. Nice. Uh, I started uh, my career as an IT consultant in PLM. Um, then at some point joined uh, Philips to actually build homegrown PLM systems. Um, and then moved uh, towards a role where I became uh, a product owner uh, for both the process as the tool side with respect to configuration management at Philips. And that was also the point where I um, came into contact with uh, Ray Wozni from uh, IPX and started to go to, onto the CM2 journey. Um, and that basically inspired me to become, uh, uh, well, also the lead architect or one of the lead architects at ASML uh, with respect to configuration management. Um, this is a, it's a journey for many years. It's, it started already in college, already in the PLM area, and then slowly you move and you make decisions and that's how I ended up at ASML. Great. Uh, a lot of people may not appreciate who ASML is. G give us a feel for how we all use things that you're a part of. Yeah, so ASML is a semiconductor equipment manufacturer. So we make uh, pretty large machines that are actually part of the production process of chips. And uh, you all use those chips like in an iPhone or in an Android phone or in computers whatsoever. And um, we have, uh, uh, I think if you use a device like that, then you have uh, uh, chips in it that are made on our machines. Interesting. Wow. So um, describe for me, for those that are not familiar with change management or configuration management and what IPX is all about, tell us what a configuration management architect does. Well, I think it's very similar to what other business architects do. Um, we look, try to look at the big picture. Um, configuration management is basically throughout the company. It, it, it basically touches every function of a company. Um, and you need to understand how it relates to all those functions and to ensure that you get control of your configuration, um, be able to manage changes very efficiently um, because the more efficient you are and the better your control is, in the end, the better the quality is and also the more innovative you will be. Um, so as an architect, um, I try to understand the whole end-to-end -end picture and translate that to requirements that we need to, to implement from a capability perspective, but also from a process perspective. Interesting. Okay. So now I understand why we need configuration management architects. And, and in my background at, at General Motors and before that, um, we certainly had those roles. We understood the importance of configuration management for, for cars and so on. Um, you know, we're all part of the Digital Enterprise Society and um, we keep hearing all these terms around Industry 4.0. Um, how, how do you guys at ASML um, consider Industry 4.0 and how do you think the Digital Enterprise Society should be aware of it? Or what should we do with it? I think if I look at, um uh, from a CM perspective, configuration management perspective, um, industry forward at all, I think cannot work if you don't understand the configuration um, that you're trying to build and okay. also trying to maintain. Um, 
and trying to upgrade. Um, uh, if you don't understand the configuration, it will be hard to make this work really well. And I think CMs plays a very integral role, integral role into this. Okay. Um, where I think one of the toughest things out there is impact analysis, something you can also talk to about with Martin and Haket. Okay. Um, and it's very difficult to do a good impact analysis to understand the impact of a change on a configuration and possibly on configuration that you already have built that are in the field the operational and you might want to upgrade them. It's very difficult to do it right and to don't make any mistakes uh, that are very costly to your business. Um, and this is also where I think industry 4.0 or um, the digital enterprise or whatever mm -hmm. name you want to give it is, is going to help make the connections to understand the bigger picture because as a as a human being it's difficult to wrap your mind around all the complexities right. that are involved in in these type of products um and with all those dependencies and all those parameters that are in play you have to somehow ha get help to make sense out of all of it yeah and that's i think from a cm perspective where uh, ifro uh, can really really be beneficial as well so so I remember one of my first meetings in the car business. Um, so I'm about 15 years into my professional career. And, and I was talking about the importance of simulation and configurations and, and how do we make decisions about a proposed change, so impact analysis. And it was interesting the the people I had in the room and said, why would we worry about all that when we can just build one and go drive it? And so the, the point was to them, a configuration was just what the latest sample build was. From my vantage point, I wanted to study robustness analysis and, you know, what what could the possible side effects be? You can't build enough experimental parts to do that, right? You really need to do it in other ways. Yeah, I, I think you're right. But even if you would build a lot of prototypes to get to your end goal, mm -hmm. you still want to control the configuration of each prototype because if you don't control it, what are you verifying? Which requirements are you verifying with a specific prototype? So you need to still have control. You need to be able to manage change on all those prototypes. So in the end, it doesn't really change the process of configuration management. It just changed. It, it's, it's just a different path with the same goal. So, so another challenge I see with the industries, which, which impressed me when I started working with you guys and, and IPX a couple years ago, is this point about executives at a lot of companies think they're already done with digital stuff. They've been investing in a while. They, they you know, in the case of where I came from, it, it's been a few decades, right? And so they think everything, you know, we, we use the term computer-aided everything, we're finished, right? And yet we still see Industry 4.0, other initiatives needed. Um, I, I think, how do you make those kind of executives who maybe think we're done more aware of the importance of continuing to improve in this area? I think um, what is very important is that we understand what uh, improvements we want to make from a business point of view, not from a digital point of view, from a business point of view, what, where can we gain as a business and then translate that to, into a business case where whether, that, whether you implement it with a, a digital solution, that's just more the solution side of it. I, I think, and that's also, I think uh, what I'm trying to do is we're trying to convince people, well, this is the problem you have. This is where you're leaking uh, money out of your company. That's the problem. If we can plug that hole and improve on that, you gain a lot of money. And that translates then to a solution. And that it's typically part is business process, but a large part is also a technical solution, which is in the digital enterprise atmosphere. Well, and that clearly means you've got to understand your current capability, your current process. It, and I think, I think a lot of times people, maybe they go to a conference like we're going to attend this week, and they hear about a technology solution and they're like, oh, we should try that. Well, before they try it, they should understand what business value are they trying to achieve, yeah. right? Yeah, you need what to understand your business first yep. and your business processes and the capability maturity where you are at to make uh, 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 basically a roadmap to where you want to be and then ha translate that into the transitions you need to take to get to your endpoint. Mm -hmm. You can't go from uh, zero to 100 in, 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 in zero seconds. It's that right. simple. You have to take time to, to with small steps to get there because a large part of this change is not the digital part of it it's the human part of it humans change not really fast <laughs> I, I, me included right i'm i'm, I'm yeah, not fast changing but it's it's changing behavior is a large part of this 
journey and you have to take into account the speed of change that people can absorb. So, so let's go there for a second. So when you guys hit a challenge with, with people's willingness to change or their ability to change, um, how did you handle that difficulty? Even though you could see the clear business value, but you had maybe folks in the, in the interim that, that didn't see the value or didn't understand it, and so they, they resisted the change. Yeah. How do you handle that? First start small uh, with a small group, mm -hmm. show the benefits. So the real tangible benefits, is if, if people start seeing, even in a small pilot group, what that change is doing to the business, that they're going, uh, can do a change faster, for instance, instead of a, a cycle of, I don't know, 150 days to let's say 100 days, uh, a change cycle mm -hmm. for sign off, um, mm -hmm. then you see the improvement, right? That's tangible. And then so people are not, uh, you don't have to go to these people to get on board. People said, hey, can I not join? Can I not be the next to join? Because yeah. I want this too. Yeah, yeah. yeah so in, in, instead of, pushing, try to get create a pool with a few people that are enthusiastic about this right. idea. There are always enough people that you can find for a pilot group. I mean, you don't need that many people to do That's that. That's true. And yeah. just make it small enough that you can really understand what the change is about, because these people need to go through a change. They will go to a, a valley of despair and, and, and go back up. <laughs> and you yeah. and if, the, if the group is small, it's manageable. If the group is large, it, it takes a lot longer to get through this valley. Yeah, and so so for those of you that have been listening into our podcast, the Valley of Despair is the beginning of the hype curve, and you, you've got to get through that. And when you get through it, there's usually a lot of a benefit for a while, and then things begin to level off as you mature. Um, you're, you're presenting, along with a colleague of yours, in the next couple of days here, and, and you had a, an interesting title to, to your session about ignorance is bliss. What do you mean by that? Explain that. Well, what happens, uh, and this is ha this happening uh, happens especially in large companies. In small companies, <laughs> if you do an impact analysis, yeah, everybody knows everybody, right? So if, if you do an impact analysis and you forget to involve people from other functions, you know they have to clean up your mess, and they know you, right? And that might be even your best friend, yeah. right? So you will ensure that you talk to. Uh, Susan from manufacturing whatsoever to understand if, if the change that you are planning to do is possible or not. Okay. In large companies, yeah, there is a lot more anonymity. People are hiding in the masses <laughs> in their comfort zone. So if you look at, it, at, at people's network, professional network within a company, in a small company, your professional network is very diverse in 100% of the company. Right. Where in a very large company, your professional network might be larger in total number of people but it might be just one percent of the company and very not very diverse so so you explain how asml affects all of us with the parts produced that are in our electronic devices i don't have any idea how big is it how, how many people are, are you in that super large company of lots of people and therefore there's ignorance or are you guys uh, a lot smaller than like a big car company I think we're smaller than a big car company. We're about 24,000 employees, okay. so not small, but- You're not hundreds, small. right? No, so we're a serious company. Okay. Um, and I'm not saying that, um, it's, it's not that people, that people had the ignorance for people is, 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 is not the problem of the people. It's a problem of the system around the people yeah. that people are not pulled into uh, the discussion to have the alignment with other people from other functions. And, it, and I mean, it's not that it always happens. It's just it happens from time to time, right? Uh, but it can have serious consequences, mm -hmm. um, and you have to, you have to be able to prepare people to understand how to to deal with that. Because um, if you're in a large company, if you have to align with somebody from manufacturing and you're in engineering, yeah, do you call uh, 188 manufacturing? And that's yeah. not what you're gonna do. Right. Um, you want a name. You want to have a face that you have to contact to understand if something is possible or not. That's something that um, is, is, is where sometimes ignorance can hit because if you find a change and you couldn't do it at 20% material cost saving, you can, can be blindsided for all the other areas where there might be impact because you don't know those people. Right. right. That's a little bit what this is about. Okay. All right. So the goal is to get rid of ignorance through just making sure everybody's aware. Everybody that's affected is aware. That way they understand better why it is we're proceeding with a change. Yeah. Right? And especially with the relationships that uh, also with the model-based enterprise are being created more and more, 
It's mm -hmm. a lot easier to connect people. It's a lot easier to apply analytics to say, well, you did a, a, a change that is very similar to this one in the past. And now, well, here you said this was impacted. Now you don't say this is impacted. So why not? Yeah. And, and trigger people before it's too late. Yeah. So instead of becoming a, a corrective action, you now can make it a preventive action. Well, and I think that that's an interesting uh, way that organizations know they're improving is when they have more purposeful change, change they intended, and not corrective action. Exactly. That's just a simple measure. And if that ratio stays greater than one, uh, desired change versus um, corrective change, you're in great shape. If it's actually the other way where it's less than one, uh, just that ratio of numbers, right? Oh, then you know you haven't, you know, you really got other problems, exactly. whatever they are, training problems, educational problems, leadership problems, whatever. So you, you also had a, an interesting um, byline in the abstract about documents leading and then parts follow. I, I understand your principle there, but especially in, in large companies where we have hundreds or thousands of parts, a lot of times we have goals of high part reuse, right? You don't really care that the connectors, uh, bolts inside of an engine block are the same from all kinds of General Motors cars. You just care that it works, right? So from an efficiency point of view, I've got an existing part and it's geometry that I want to reuse in all my products. Does that conflict with your, your point about documents lead and parts follow? Yeah. Documents to us are, are in, a, in the car business, can be very misleading except for performance specifications. Yeah. Right? You really kind of want to go back to this is the existing part and the existing geometry and that's what you're going to use. Yeah. So in, in the in the world of CM2, the document and nowadays they call it a data set which makes it a little bit broader. broader. So, okay. so you should read the document in the broadest sense possible. It's basically document of requirements. It can be a specification, can be a requirements document, can be basically any okay. type of document. Um, but in this context, it basically means that requirements lead and parts follow. If you don't understand the requirement, ah. you cannot have the part. So with reuse, if you don't understand the requirement, how can you reuse a part? Well, yeah, and I think that's that's a key thing. We, we oftentimes talk about the distinction of a requirement and a constraint. In a sense, the reuse goal is a constraint. You shall use existing parts. That way we don't have to do the engineering on them. We don't have to make them. We don't have to test them and so on. So, um, well, this has been a fascinating discussion and I look forward to hearing your presentations this week. And um, I, I get to interview your colleague later in the week, so I'll make sure I ask the questions that didn't get answered in your okay. session. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Tom, it's back to you. So, Martin, one of the things we try to do each week here on this show is we try to bring interesting interviews like you so that we can help our listeners enhance and grow their careers. So you talked about a lot of really interesting stuff along the lines of, of sort of the how-to for the company. Let's flip this over to like the average listener who has a job, they're working in this digital enterprise. What can they do to grow their career? Well, I think if you are interested in um, CM and you want to have a real role in CM, not just the, 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 the administrative part of CM, but really understand CM enterprise-wide, I think you need to be, first be trained in it. I think CM2 is an excellent methodology. Um, uh, I was inspired by their trainings. Uh, that's why I'm here where I am now. Um, and I think that's the first step. And uh, my career is uh, uh, partly due to the fact that I was trained by Ray Wozni. Uh, and I, yeah, he's a great guy. Um, and I think that's the first step you have to do. Find th something that you really love to do and then get trained even further. Try to learn more about it. Um, uh, usually with something like the the standard well for me the cm2 is the standard in enterprise cm so again thank you so much for coming and joining us here i think we really appreciate this this is kind of fun uh craig don't you agree to be able to do these interviews face to face here at connex 19. well yeah because you communicate with more than a voice you got body language and all kinds of things but anyways it, it's great having you here and i'm looking forward to the rest of the week and the other interviews we've got set up Awesome. Hey, and thank you everybody for tuning in. Join us next week when we'll have more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around the product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more Connection with 